Hey, I'm running back to continue my discussion about my visionary state experiences I've been having throughout my life. And um, this is like a very important part of my story, okay? And I want to point out that I, um, if you're not familiar with this discussion, I've created a, play a playlist called the Jody Vision that um, has at least a hundred videos now. So I started this discussion shortly after my good friend Rosie died in September of 2022 and it's taken me this long to get to what I consider to be the juicy center okay so um, <clears throat> so in my past couple of videos I talked about a time trip where I skipped from November 2nd of 99 to January 27th of 2000 and then when I went back, I kind of felt like something was going on, but a lot of that had slipped my mind. And so when I went to see my dad for Christmas and New Year's, I was feeling really nervous, like I knew something was going on. And so um, while I was down there, um, I had seen the fifth element, and I saw that part, it looked like a clip of me and my friend Jeremy flipping off some big wig at the Capitol. And, um, and before I left, I was telling my dad, I feel like there's some kind of a conspiracy going on here, you know? And so when I went back to Denver, um, I had a really bad case of the flu. So it put me out of work for a little bit. And I can't remember a whole lot about January. But, you know, when I did my time trip, I found that I had this uh, little coffee table with a glass top on it. Well, um, one day I was saying, you know... It'd be nice if I could just find myself um, like a little coffee table, maybe something with a glass top on it. And shortly after that, one of my friends said, Jody, I think somebody left the coffee table out back for you. And it was placed carefully on top of the dumpster so that way it wasn't messed up or anything. So I was able to retrieve it, bring it in the house. And so by the time I caught up to where I went in time travel, I had this coffee table. <laughs> and so anyways... um. When I catch up to the point where I time travel to, it's kind of like having really vivid deja vu. It makes you feel like this has already happened before. And so I think one of the first things that caught my attention was um, we were watching the, uh, the the news. So me, Lynn, and Jeremy were living together still, watching the news. And they were saying um, Flight 88 was like a commercial airline number. It crashed just outside of uh, San Francisco into the ocean and they uh, found the plane but they're not finding bodies and first thing we were thinking was oh, what if they were abducted by aliens you know maybe the everyone on board disappeared <laughs> and the plane went down empty it was the impression we were getting but then when they came back down later they said that they were finding the the bodies of the people who were on board this plane and then we were laughing about it because uh, my one friend pointed out, boy, that newscaster looked like she was scared and, you know, like her eyes had like a wide-eyed look to them as she was explaining this, like it wasn't really true. So, you know, so it started off laughing about this possibility that Flight 88 was a major case of a UFO abduction. And, um, and I realized I had started sensing deja vu earlier that day, like when we walked past that boiler room. Um, I felt like deja vu going by there and um, and I kind of made that connection later that oh that's right you know um, that's when Jeremy took me down into the boiler room and said we had time travel so now <clears throat> I made some notes so hopefully I don't forget anything because um, the, the thing is it's been really difficult to tell this story because I never really kept a diary and you know we're talking about something that happened like you know 24 years ago and so I'm 48 now, and that makes that like half my lifetime ago. So I'm really impressed that I can remember all this stuff because I am, I do tend to be kind of forgetful. So um, I think um, I'm, I'm pretty good about this because I've thought about it so much and and I've kind of gone over it a number of times. So since this has happened, I've been spending a lot of time processing what happened. I want to know why. It's really interesting stuff. So anyways, February 3rd of 2000 <laughs> is really the day that it's such an important part of my story because this is what really helped me understand that I'm time traveling, okay? So in reality, my friend Jeremy and I were working at a temp agency and going out to a lot of the same jobs together. And so we were probably coming from their office and walking through Denver to 
go to the bank because we were walking down between the uh, the state capitol and the and the city set the city civic center, and there's just like this part between Broadway and Lincoln that is just you know like a park with some sidewalks in it and uh so Jeremy and I <clears throat> were walking through that arched uh that arched site about sidewalk there and Jeremy said did you hear what he said I'm like no what did he say Jeremy says he wants to lower minimum wage and I said well why don't we flip him the bird so Jeremy and I both were flipping him the bird and he could see us from all the way across the street so there was the speaker up there in front of this crowd and I really had no idea what was going on. I just thought it was fun to be mischievous at the moment. But he did see us and he said, some people might not like what I have to say, but I don't care. Had a little bit of a country twang to his voice. And so we went and we deposited our checks and we did our day. And so later that day, I was back in my apartment, just sitting there on my bed and thinking, you know, it feels like this happened in November and and I found that when I got to this point in my life, I kept saying that same thing. This happened in November. In fact, there's a song by Front 242. It happened in November. It happened in November. So I don't know what they're singing about, but now that's going to be my soundtrack because it kept making me think this happened in November, right? Now, the other thing that was interesting is um, it did trigger my memory. Like when we went to to Key West and stayed with my dad for Christmas and New Year's. So this was my 99 and the 2000, right? So Chris and I were hanging out at my dad's place and he goes, hey, let's watch Fifth Element. And I'm like, you know what? My friend Jason told me I should probably watch this movie, right? So finally get a chance to see Fifth Element, which takes place in the far future and they're flying, you know, you know, like space cruisers and stuff like that. and. <clears throat> and somewhere in the middle of the movie, it shows the calendar date, February 3rd, 2000. And then you see the top of the uh, the state capital, Colorado, is kind of gold colored, you know. And it looks like they're filming from the building across the street, you know, just to the south. There's like this big white building. And it's scanning across. And then Chris was sitting there pointing to, like, Jody. Isn't that the Capitol building in Denver? And then as they're scanning across, you can hear the dude going, some people might not like what I have to say, but I don't care. And then there's me and Jeremy, you know, we both had on like, you know, red jackets, you know, maybe fake leather, but I'm wondering if we came across as some kind of activist or something to them in hindsight, you know, because we were wearing the matching jackets, we were flipping them off. And, and my friend Chris was pointing this out to me, Jody. Isn't that you and Jeremy? <laughs> and then another part of that building, it looked like they were in the basement of the Acacia building. And the person they showed off in a jail cell looked like uh, Bill Lieb shaving his head and giving himself that, that classic undercut he used to wear. And so this kind of corresponded with something my friend Jason told me back in 98 that um, I should see Fifth Element, that I'm going to be in the movie, the film's going to be made without me knowing, and... In fact, he said even Bill Lieb's going to have a small part in that, right? So this was all sinking in all at once. Like, oh, you know, so this happened November 8th, as far as I remember. And back in the visionary slip, that's when Jeremy was telling me that, you know, we're in, it's February 3rd, but people still think we're in November. And that's when I realized it was November 8th. And that's where I'm able to do the math and figure out where I landed, you know. <clears throat> So that was kind of scary, kind of thinking, okay, so somebody got a clip of me without knowing from the top of a government building. So I'm thinking, you know, I'm wondering if I'm in any trouble with the government now. You know, like, they're letting me know they saw us flip that guy off. And they did it by taking footage to the past and planning it in the middle of a, a copy of a movie and replacing my dad's copy. So, because they knew I was going to watch it, right? So, whoa, dude, so this was starting to hit home. I'm like, that's right. You know, that day I walked by the boiler room and I felt that sense of deja vu. That's because in the future, that's when Jeremy told me that we had time traveled. That we were just a short distance in the future towards the end of January. So it was all kind of sinking in. And then let's see here. Um, and so the other thing that was happening, so I did in my last video about the subject, it was um, bald ass Bill, right? So that's my, that seems to be kind of the implied joke. 
that um, so there was a mailbox with the name Baldus and Van Vier, and it looked like a first and last name, right? So there's no such person, but uh, since 1982, this term has been used as another name for Bill, you know, like, <clears throat> so basically um, around that time, you know, so I wasn't sure which story to tell first, February 3rd or discovering Baldus Van Vieren living upstairs, just like it had been mentioned, right? And so this is where I was able to connect uh, that magazine article to that name. So I was saying I had a copy of Goldmine magazine. The article was about Skinny Puppy, but there was a small section about Bill Lee of Frontline Assembly, probably because he had been part of Skinny Puppy. And there was that clip that looked like my friend Rosie had mentioned to me that she's a freelance writer and that I'm going to uh, see something. Sometimes she writes about music, you know, so I thought, you know, maybe Rosie has a connection with the music business because the quote in that magazine was the exact quote I heard back in 1982 when I was first introduced to Bill Lieb. You know, six years old, uh, he appeared to be two years older than me. And so, you know, my mom and dad are sitting here on the couch. I remember the room was, everything was so real, you know, it's like we were at a, a house trailer, kind of like ours. Rosie and Howard were sitting on the couch against that wall. And I remember the whole quote that uh, his name is Ballas Van Vieren, but we call him Billy because it's easier. Um, and he will, <clears throat> and he came from Austria by a form of time travel to meet his future wife. And then they mentioned the band will be, we need to look out for Frontline Assembly and he'll be known as uh, Billy. And um, let's see, so I was making this connection to this whole conversation. I'm like, oh, that's right. I was told I was going to time travel. So that brought me back to that conversation with Rosie. Didn't she tell me? You know, that I'm going to time travel in a, a year from now um, at the time of the conversation would have been fall of uh, 98, you know. So again, in one of these visionary slips, Rosie was explaining all this to me. I'm going to time travel. Um, <clears throat> and I did. So I wasn't in touch with Rosie, so I couldn't call her up. So anyways, uh, also remembering, you know, Blaine coming over and explaining this whole you're going to time travel thing. Not to mention, I did see New Order around, like Blaine said, I'm going to see members. And I think I saw Bernard Sumner over at Amy's house and maybe Julian Gilbert coming up the hall. And then I started remembering that story of my dad's where, um, you know, it was about uh, the general of a Austrian mafia or the general of an Austrian army. Maybe both terms have been used to describe somebody who's a time traveler who would... Uh, go and meet his uh, future wife by a form of time travel when she was at the age of six. And then, um, <clears throat> and so it was all starting to sneak in. Oh, that's right. My dad told me about this too, you know? And so that story had so much information, you know, you, you just can't remember it all at once. But um, some of the stuff he was talking about was how, um, you know, so him being the time traveler, he would see her at different points in his life. You know, and uh, so some of those might be the ones that I remember, but then there might have been ones where I didn't see him. Like, um, maybe in about second grade, I had this little boyfriend named David Cosby, and we were walking with our arms around each other, and my cousin Stephen ran over and said, Hey, get out of here, you little fat boy. He chased my little boyfriend off and told me he'd seen my boyfriend, Billy, and how, uh, you know, he really didn't like seeing me with another boyfriend, you know, so... That might be one of those times he dropped in on me. Um, and I was kind of getting the impression that uh, when I was in high school, I used to have like an undercut and take my hair and just stand it up. Like I really didn't know about Bill even his haircut yet. So it's kind of cool that I had a similar idea. Like I had an undercut and I would make it tall. So I'm thinking, you know, that was like maybe 11th grade. Did I do that? I might have done that in 11th grade. So I was kind of getting the impression that, oh my God, you know, uh, Bill Lieb saw me with my hair like that. And, uh, and then later on, you know, um, let me see. So I would see him at some party and he would be, you know, younger. You know, he would look younger to me because maybe that's a younger version of Bill. And that's where I'm like, oh, my God, I remember Jason telling me I'm going to go to this warehouse party. And like the real life Bill's going to be on one side of the building and the time traveler Bill's going to be on the other side of the building. So I'm like, OK, this is starting to add up now. Right. So, you know, when uh, that February third of 2000 uh, event occurred, I felt like this started helping me wake up and remember everything. And so, you know, I was going through this 
period of just like, oh, that's right. I remember this. I remember that. And so then I'm like, okay, that explains, you know, my dad was telling me in his story how, um, so I was put in touch with him without knowing a few times because he wanted to be able to talk to me without me knowing who he was. That way maybe I would just be myself, you know. And so I first tried to contact him in 1995 by looking up his number and calling somebody with a similar name. And I wondered if he called back ever since, right? But then, you know, and the thing is, is I told him, you know, I'm going to go to Denver and that I was interested in frontline assembly and stuff. But I thought he was my dad's friend, Kelly. And then I'm thinking maybe in hindsight, maybe I did get Bill Levi on the phone and tell him all that stuff because, uh, you know, back in 96 and 97, I had those friends that said they knew a guy named Bob that drives that white Trans Am. So like Aaron, like, like let's see, just before that Frontline Assembly show, it looked like that guy Bob was dropping Aaron off and then he connected with me and then he put me on the phone with Bob who could have been Bill. You know, so that's where, like, you know, Bill knew I was coming in Denver, so they were able to set this up, right? That's the idea, so not necessarily true, but it's the idea I was getting. And then my friend Dan had that that guy, Bob, and so, like, okay, so maybe I've been put on the phone with him and all this. And um trying to see what I put in my notes here. And so I'm starting to remember, oh, my God, that's right, you know, um... Just like my dad's story, you know, that he had seen me throughout different parts of his life. I would also see him through different parts of my life, too. And so I was starting to remember, okay, so that explains Billy, you know. So Billy was the best part I could remember because I always thought he was my first boyfriend after I moved to the Florida Keys. And it was the first time I ever had a fist fight with somebody, too, you know. So it's super memorable, but um, I had no idea I was going into visionary state until now. And I'm like... I did um, catch on a couple different times, so, but here's the thing, it was like an 18-year process from 82 to 2000 to really make me aware that I am going into visionary state, but you know, when I reached the age of 18, I had also suspected that Bill Leap and Bill are the same person, but the only way that could be possible is if it was in visionary state, so then I started realizing, okay, so they've been trying to tell me somebody wants to marry me, and it must be Billy, you know, because when I think about it, you know, my sister calling me up and saying, hey, Jody, remember Billy? So she even said his name, you know, but then there was Rosie saying, hey, you have a soulmate. He's known you all in your life and all this type of stuff. So, and not to mention Amy from up the hall. She must have said that, like, you know, before I went to Key West. I don't know if it happened in November. <laughs> but, you know, it seemed like um, Amy came by and said, hey, Jody, somebody wants to marry you. And so and she said that, I'm like, so what if somebody wants to marry me? I don't care. I'm probably not even interested in them. But then when I went to uh, to Key West in 99, um, I had major deja vu because in 98 I did a time travel thing, you know. So just for just long enough to uh, see Chris Smith there and be like, how did you get here? And have my dad tell me, hey, Jody, somebody wants to marry you. And me thinking, so what if somebody wants to marry me? I'm probably not even interested, right? <laughs> So I started realizing, okay, somebody wants to marry me, right? And um, and I was trying to put all this together, like, you know, like Rosie telling me I have to write to him, I have to go on to the internet and everything, right? So, <clears throat> so since I discovered the, um, the name Baldus Van Vieren, <clears throat> and started remembering all this stuff, then I thought, okay, you know, why is this happening? You know, why, why did uh, I go to see the Frontline Assembly a couple times and not make the connection? And I think the answer to that was like, there were certain things that needed to happen first. Like maybe he also had to become aware of what's happening as well, kind of like I did, you know? So that could be an excuse for why we didn't make the connection quite yet. So anyways, um, I was trying to see if I could contact Bill by going on the, the internet. You know, that was kind of an idea I got from Rosie. So there was that mindphaser.com, which was their official band page. And it just seemed like, you know, I was kind of getting responses on there. Like people were, um, somebody would mention, like, say, whatever music I was listening to that day, somebody would mention that band or, you know, just little stuff. Like it was probably just a coincidence, but sometimes so paranoid, you know. But then I started saying, you know, I remembered Bill Lieb from my visions and stuff or, you know, just trying to find a way to connect with him. You know, I didn't, it didn't seem like I was connecting with him on this band site. It just seemed like there were nothing but fans. And for all I know, he probably never reads this stuff. 
but I was trying really hard at the time and um, I was saying, you know, maybe we could meet at the park or something. And somebody wrote on there like, more like they'd rather try parking their meat. And so one day I had the inclination to get up and look out my window. And I saw this person, they had this, uh, this red colored, you know, nice red car, but it was almost kind of blocky shaped. And they, they, they were parallel parking and they did a perfect job. And for no reason whatsoever, they pulled out. But then they pulled back in. And then they pulled out. And then they pulled back in. And it's like, I don't know how many times they did it, but they did it enough times that I knew they were messing with me. And I thought it had a, a correlation to the parking your meat comment, right? I'm like, oh, okay, I get it. Ha, ha, ha. And I think I even said something like, oh, my God. And then I started remembering that movie, uh, you got mail, you know, where the girl was going online trying to meet some guy. And then when she was looking out her window, she thought they were making a similar joke. And that's where it looked like they filmed somebody in my apartment looking out that same window. <laughs> and so stuff like that was thinking, I'm like, oh, no, you know, so like not only was there the fifth element thing, then there was this. And then I started remembering, oh, that's right. And then even um, Frontline Assembly had a video. It looked like there was a clip of Bill Lieb in that apartment. <laughs> right. And so... I'm starting to put this all together, you know, that um, <clears throat> maybe there were some connections like with the I'm so sexy dot com because I was seeing certain names on there and that uh, that character, one of the owners of I'm so sexy was living down off of Alameda and Logan where uh, somebody had mentioned Bill Lieb goes to, to work at a studio, right? So I was making all these connections and then my dad coming into town and buying me that psychic TV compilation that had like a collage of pussies all over it. Now, one of the things that happened too is all this stuff was starting to sink in. I was getting really scared, you know, and I was trying to tell my friends, you know, I think something's going on, you know. And I think one day I turned up the music really loud to try to whisper to them like, man, I don't know if somebody's watching us or what, but something's going on. But then our power got turned out. Now... I'm kind of messy, you know, but I kind of remember where things are. And I know I had one of my favorite psychic TV shirts were laying on the floor, kind of by the table near the door. And it had gone missing, you know, I was looking for it because I wanted to wear it. But then there were these two guys that were kind of hanging around the building. Now, this was right while it was under construction and the doors were open and they were kind of putting in new windows in some of the apartments we doing the sidewalks, okay? So, but they had the door going because I don't know if they were painting and doing other stuff in the electric room. But yeah, anyway, seeing those two guys tiptoeing around, um, there was kind of a bigger guy. He almost looked like my friend Scott, we, you know, but bigger, had kind of blonde curly hair, slightly fat but strong. And then he had a skinnier looking friend that was like dark hair, handlebar mustache. But one day I seen these two characters and the guy had on a psychic TV shirt, kind of like the one of mine that was missing. And so um, my power got turned out for three days, and I've been calling the the power company every day, asking them, you know, to help me get my power back on, because, you know, I've been paying my bill and everything. And so it took some time to send someone down there, and I'm like, well, your power should be on, you know, we don't see anything wrong. And so I had to uh, call back and wait, and each time it was like, your power should be on, everything should be fine. And so on the third day, I found out the power was shot out from inside the building in its electrical room. And so after I figured that out, we got our lights on, that's when I was walking down the hall and I seen those two guys kinda um, grinning at me and they were slipping into the electric room. And I realized, you know, those guys might have been responsible for turning out our power. And so um, that's, you know, where I was starting to wonder if this has something that Temple of Psychic Youth, you know, cause, um, you know, when my dad came out to Colorado in 88 to meet Psychic TV, he had that friend named Kelly. And that's why I came to Denver, or I moved to Denver, hoping I would make connections with people with industrial music. And one of the people I met when I first came to Denver was, like, the guy that was the head of Temple of Psychic Youth. So I was starting to get suspicious, because, you know, when all this was going on, I was going up to 7-Eleven. And I thought I saw that guy sitting out there, but I didn't recognize it till after the fact. So when I bought my shit and came back around, he was all gone. But I was going to go and talk to him, but that's when I started suspecting. Maybe Temple of Psychic Youth is doing something here. And um, and then I started remembering, oh, that's right. I was told something about that, that these guys were going to try to help uh, to put me and Bill together. And then I also reflected on even Master Tay. Like, 
you know, when I went out to California, his friend was telling me something about how sometimes Master Tay helps people get married. And I was remember somehow in my visions, he had something to do with helping me on this, right? So that's where when I think back to Jason telling me about Master Tay and the same vision about, um, you know, Bill Lieb and finding myself in a movie, stuff like this. And then I started realizing, oh, that's right. You know, my dad's got a lot of connections probably, you know, from way back in Michigan even, you know. And um, I'm trying to think of that band, you know. I thought maybe my dad could have been involved with a band from Detroit even. Like, probably not. But I was making too many connections. But I thought, you know, since he had written to Bushido, I had that guy that I'd seen on the Navy base in my Taekwondo class and... uh then I thought of, you know, Jason was telling me he's got connections and he even took me to his dad's house and showed me a studio. And that, by the way, he was staying over at the Art and Action building where um, they may have had the, the Temple of Psychic Youth headquarters at some point, you know. So I was making all these connections. Like, even my dad's probably been involved with this for all these years, you know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and helping to uh, inspire some of the, the songs that have come out. In fact, you know, it's the idea I was getting that he's a songwriter and and sometimes people use his lyrics, so I don't know. I mean, this is like where I'm starting to get delusional and making too many connections. So I was getting the impression that maybe, you know, um, this is something that's been going on all my life. And I think back to 1982. I think back to my dad contacting Bushido. And so I'm making all these points and connections. And I'm like, oh, okay, you know, maybe, you know, uh, like I was told, you know, there's a special program and... uh like band members from New Order saw the future. And then I'm remembering, oh, that's right. My dad was telling me, you know, uh, the people that lived up the hall, like Amy and Debbie, uh, their dad has a record company. And so their brother David is the one that met me when I went to see D. Croups and the Young Gods when I first came to Denver. I stayed in touch with them the whole time. That's how I ended up in this building. These are the guys who introduced me to Rosie, you know. So everything kind of connected through this uh, friend, David and Amy and... That's, you know, when Amy was coming by St. Jody, somebody wants to marry me. And I'm just thinking, how come all these people know shit, you know? So I was kind of excited when I was putting it together. Like, okay, so people have been trying to tell me all this time, you know, that Bill Lee wants to marry me. And so I'm just wondering, you know, why hasn't he contacted me then? So, like, there again, um, he had to kind of wake up to what was going on. But at the same time, um, for some reason, um, he's just not able to contact me. Um... I don't know if it's because he's a time traveler or whatever, but it's like he's always being watched and he doesn't want to be seen contacting me. So that might be why he's being put in contact with me without knowing about it. Or like that guy from the snake pit was trying to invite me down to that place at Logan and Alameda and all that stuff. So I've been wearing this jade ring, you know, probably December 99, you know. Um, I was like just thinking, why am I, you know, being put through all this stuff to, um, to try to connect with this guy and have all this trouble um you know please help me understand so I put that jade ring on with a prayer to understand you know why I'm uh making this connection with Bill Lieb and it seemed like that's the day when I realized um I don't know if it was the parking joke or whatever but then I kind of thought my friend Charlie was involved with Bill Lieb but kind of lying about it because um I'd mentioned before I thought I'd seen him on stage with the band but then he kept saying he doesn't know them but then it started seeming like he was in on it. But that's because Charlie was, um, he was kind of catching on to what I was thinking. And so he was playing along. So he was just making things worse. But so when Charlie came over to my apartment, I kind of thought that was a sign that, um, I don't know, maybe all at once I realized, oh my God, he really does love me. And all this stuff is coming true. And, and so I've had this uh, jade ring on, I don't know, for almost a couple of months. And all of a sudden the the where it's tied seems to decide to come undone the jade ring falls off and it breaks in half and it was perfectly broken in half it was a nice piece of red and white jade I got from Master Tay you know and so I don't know if that had something to do with me realizing okay this is what I needed to realize the reason I'm then put through all this stuff to make a connection with Bill Lieb is because he loves me you know and so you know this whole thing you know waking up made me realize oh this is so wonderful you know I think I've always loved him too and I remember um, in my vision being told how I might have confided in a friend of his. So I thought this was the friend I should confide in. So that's why I told Charlie, you know, how much I love Bill Lieb. <laughs> so I was hoping I could confide in Charlie and then he could go back and tell Bill, <laughs> which is kind of funny. So um, this is where um, 
to me, I was real happy to find this is all coming true. And then, but then I was starting to get stressed out because um, nothing was happening. Like it just seemed like, um, and I couldn't get a hold of Bill. And I was, you know, I, I thought, you know, going to mindphaser.com, it was not a good way to get a hold of him. And so, you know, I remember again some of that stuff from my dad's story about some of the stuff that's going on. It seems to be like some of it seems to make sense here. Like, um, <clears throat> Let me see. So, like, uh, I'm trying to say, trying to be put in touch with me. I think my dad was talking about that. Um, how he had uh, been keeping an eye on her, maybe had gone in her apartment, all this type of story, you know, talking about us in the third person. And that's when I started noticing this guy in the uh, the red hat, you know. So when I started noticing this guy, um, I realized my friend Jason told me that when I saw Bill leave, he'd be dressed like this. And I'd seen him around a couple of times, and um, but I was afraid to go right up to him. He looked like he could have been Bill, but I was never really sure. So like, um, so for example, that one time I seen him going down the hall in front of me, like just before I got to my apartment, I saw him turn off the wrong way into that closet, you know, like what's he going in there for? Or the time I thought I caught him, you know, coming over to where I train and stuff like that. So that's where like, I thought, aha, so, you know, I remember my dad's story saying, you know, he might have had different places to stay. So I was trying to figure out exactly where this guy's staying. You know, is he up in 311 or is he, um, I thought I saw him go down to the other end of the hall where this older guy lived. And I swear it almost like looked like Bill Lee wearing a wig one day going up the hall. And then of course tying in with some, uh, some visionary slip, you know, like he was coming out of Amy's and going down to the old man's place. And so another time, you know, um, there was this kid with the, like, blue hair, you know, a young man going with blue hair down the door into that side. See, my friend Jeremy always seemed to know what was going on. That's the funny thing, you know, so like, um, so I'm thinking in the future, um, in the visionary slip, he told me that kid's name was, uh, Jeremy Inkle, and, uh, he's a young guy that, uh, Bill Deep had gotten involved with, you know. And so, um... I'm starting to think, well, maybe Bill Lee's going down into that apartment down there, and then uh, maybe he's staying across the street, you know, because then one day my landlord came to me and said, you know, uh, the neighbors across the street are complaining. He said that uh, it sounds like you've got this recording of a growling dog playing over and over from your apartment. And that's funny, you know, because um, when my friend Dan was telling me he had this friend Baldus over to visit, you know, um, they were kind of teasing my bird and making it growl, and, and Baldus said that, my bird sounded like a tape recording of a dog growling, you know? So all these weird connections going on here. So, you know, where at first I was excited to think, you know, maybe Bill Lieb uh, is this person he's known me all my life and he wants to marry, but, but then I find out he's kind of sneaking around and he won't talk to me. And so I started to feel really kind of scared. You know, what if, uh, you know, what if something's wrong with Bill or, or furthermore, what if this isn't Bill? Because, you know, I would tell my friends I thought I saw Bill leave and they're like, Jody, that's not Bill. You know, like my friend Jeremy, he seemed like a know-it-all. He's like, Jody, that's not Bill. Well, Jeremy was uh, the one that told me in the future that we had time traveled. Jeremy was the one on February 3rd that told me we were in the future. And then like, um, I remember Jeremy being along at a lot of some of these jobs. So I'm thinking towards the end of February, um, in reality, I was working at one of these banquet jobs thinking, you know, I remember this like it happened in November. The only difference was Jeremy was here the whole time. So in the visionary slip, you know, maybe Lynn and Jeremy stayed with me a little bit longer. But then in reality, they moved out sooner because I wasn't working and I was just totally obsessed over Bill Lieb. And, and it looked like um, I wasn't going to be good companion for them anymore. So this is where I kind of got left that on my own would probably be by the end of February. And so that's funny because when I woke up from the time slip and I was trying to uh, readjust to the now, uh, one of my biggest flashbacks was around that time. So that might have been the split where uh, Jeremy was no longer with me in the reality. <laughs> and so that's where like, um, you know, I was having deja vu every day, just kind of like riding the bus to one of my jobs and uh, thinking, I remember this, you know, like from the past and I remember the thoughts I was having when I was in the time slip going, you know, I skipped over Christmas and I'm in the future. I'm like, am I ever going to go back and see Christmas? Well, at this point I had, and so I'm, I'm making all this connection and connecting the dots, right? 
So anyways, um, I was trying to figure out exactly what's all going on here. So of course, you know, I was asking everybody if they remembered Billy, you know, like my mom and dad and, you know, anybody that could have been in these conversations. Now, of course, I couldn't get a hold of Rosie and I wasn't able to get through to Bill Lieb. And then, um, you know, um, <clears throat> my dad and my grandma decided to tell me, you know, it's time to like, you know, quit smoking pot and partying and all this stuff because they thought this is driving me crazy. And my grandma was telling my dad he shouldn't help me as long as I'm partying and it's causing me to not be able to keep a job, then she shouldn't be, you know, giving me any kind of financial support. So they were going to start trying to teach me a lesson. In fact, my dad came out to, uh, he was supposed to be trying to get a place in Denver, but then he was going to take me home. So um, I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about where, um, you know, I found out that uh, Baldus Van Buren was two different people's last names. And so all this stuff starts to turn into a big disappointment because basically what's happening is um, this just seems to be a really extravagant way of tricking me into thinking, you know, uh, Bill, of, of front, Bill Lieb of Frontline Assembly is going to ask me to marry him someday. But then I come to find out these have only been visionary slips. Um, the guy was actually married. Um, and from what we gather, he doesn't really know who I am in reality either, right? So um, I haven't really gotten any feedback from Bill Leap. He's been really nice and friendly and, you know, I've told him all about this stuff. And it's like, well, thanks for your messages. You know, like, I appreciate the messages and um, hope you're doing really well. And, you know, he never himself calls me crazy, but, you know, I've had to hear it from everybody else, you know. So that's why I consider this to be sort of part of a, a crazy making experience. But at the same time... Um, it's important to understand this is um, when the big revelation is being made to me would be February 3rd of 2000 and it took me catching up to where I had time traveled to knowing that I had seen myself in that movie but then I started remembering the conversations you know like finding Baldus Van Buren on the mailbox and remembering a magazine article remembering they've been telling me about this person since 1982 and um you know, for all I know, my dad might have known about this all along because he contacted uh, Gary Levermore with Third Mind Records, like right after they signed Frontline Assembly, and then they wrote to us, and that's when I thought I seen Bill Lieb around. Somebody saying, "You see that guy? He wants to get you into the music business someday." And then even at that party I talked about, um, you know, that person I met from the Snake Pit came up and said hi to me, and then introduced me to somebody. It was telling me. Uh, there's somebody that wanted to meet me there, and that's when I started wondering if that's going to be, you know, I was thinking I almost got in touch with uh, the people from Bushido, so I don't know if Gary Levermore was there, but I got the impression that I was this close to meeting them, and stuff like that, so I'm just thinking, oh, well, you know, so, um, you know, when you go into this kind of music, they really want people to be self-taught, so like when I first came to Denver, and uh, my friend Kelly's a music producer, and I was asking him to teach me, he's like, well, go to the library, and so it kind of gave me the impression that you know, maybe they've been doing things to help cultivate me as a possible artist, you know, because I think I've got quite an education from my dad about music and its intent. But um, I didn't really get much education on music production itself. So I feel like I've been left to just sort of figure that out for myself. And at the same time, maybe, you know, um, people have been waiting for me to emerge, you know, as an artist. And I've always thought, well, as soon as I emerge as an artist, there's going to be people right, right there waiting for me. And so this could be very much a delusion. But so that's where um, uh, basically the big reveal is being made by the discovery of what happened on February 3rd and this character Baldus. But then I'm going to come to find out this was all a false narrative and there's no such thing in... Uh, you know, um, <laughs> the thing is, is I kind of quit trusting Jeremy, too. So that's part of the reason they had to go, because it just seemed like he knew too much. And he was the one that was always kind of filling me in on things. And, like, you know. And so I was getting kind of scared, like, you know, maybe it's not what I think. Like, maybe there is no record company. And if there is, um, there just seems to be, like, a really bigger, a bigger uh, situation where, um you know, maybe, uh, okay, so if there's time travel involved with this record company and, you know, the, uh, the men in black are probably watching every inch of this shit, right? So that's when it started to turn into a very scary experience. So it went from me being happy 
to discovering it to being very frightened to discover it. So anyways, I'm going to end this here and be back with a few more uh, stories per pertaining to this part of my life before we move on to other stories. Uh, so this seems to be one of the biggest and best parts of my story where we're like right at the core where I have discovered that yes, I've been going into visionary state and I've had glimpses of the future. And so this could be good training for future possibility of me going into visionary state. So I like to examine it, you know, with clarity and hindsight as um, excellent training. Otherwise, um, this is a very confusing and probably a very personal story. And I think the most difficult thing about telling the story is because it has so many details to it and to be able to remember it all and, you know, so complex that I've had to iron it out myself. And so as the listener, it's probably even more complicated. So hopefully, you know, I'll make other videos that help tie it all together and simplify it. Anyways, I'll be back soon with more stories. Bye-bye now.